Hello, everyone. Welcome to a Polaro NASA webinar with NACA, the Native American Contractors Association. Today, this afternoon's webinar is about organizational conflicts of interest and post-government employment restrictions. We do have to offer this disclaimer that the material that we were presenting is we're doing so with the understanding that the author, that is Blair Mazza, is not rendering any legal accounting or other professional service or advice. Because of the nature of law and that it is rapidly changing, you should always research original sources of authority in order to you know, make sure that you have the best guidance possible. In no event is Polaro Mazza responsible or liable for any direct, indirect, or consequential damages re resulting from the use of this material. And for the webinar today, uh, it will be led by myself, Megan Connor, there's my picture, and Michelle Litigan, my colleague, who's in the picture below with the nice cherry blossoms in the background. There are our email addresses and our phone number. Please feel free to email us questions. We will have time for questions at the end, but as you might anticipate, so much of this is fact-specific, OCIs and post-government employment restrictions, that we just might not be able to answer a question during the webinar. Um, and we got some questions in advance, and, and it will do the best we can, but please feel free to email us. You will receive a copy of this presentation. That's always the number one question that we get. Yes, you will receive, receive a copy of this presentation. It's also available on our website. And here is more information about what we offer. We're on Twitter. The presentation will also be on our YouTube channel. And Plero Mazza is a full service law firm. We're known for our government contracting practice and in particular our knowledge of the small business programs, but we do a full range of services for our clients, corporate, labor and employment, SBA procurement programs and litigation. So please feel free to reach out to us. And with that, we'll get into the, the nuts and bolts of what we're going to be talking about. Michelle is going to lead it off by introducing OCIs and what they are. We're also going to discuss how to waive an OCI. We're going to discuss strategic considerations like proposals and protests dealing with OCIs. Then we're going to get into the restrictions on post-government employment. In this section, we're going to just broadly describe what the restrictions are, and obviously we're, we're tailoring it. We're assuming that the participants here are contractors or businesses that work with contractors, so we are looking at it from that point of view. The presentation is less for current government employees who are thinking of jumping ship and going elsewhere. We do want to gear it towards companies that want to employ these people. And in that regard, we're going to discuss some recommendations on how to handle the hiring of former government employees. And then again, we'll get to the Q&A at the end. And with that, I'll let Michelle lead us into OCIs. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to talk about OCIs, also known as Organizational Conflicts of Interest. You, you've probably all heard of these because they're a growing problem, largely driven by industry consolidation and the government buying the types of services like acquisition support that can implicate OCIs. These are important considerations for government contractors because it can lead to exclusion from procurements or you can end up defending a post-award bid protest and it can impact your business. You might have to set up mitigation measures that make you a little less efficient or you might ultimately end up restructuring or selling off part of your company to be able to effectively mitigate an OCI. So here's our overview of OCIs. According to the FAR, an OCI arises when because of other relationships or circumstances, a contractor may be unable or potentially unable to render impartial advice or assistance to the government. The, contract, the contractor's objectivity in performing the contract work is or might be impaired and or the contractor would have an unfair competitive advantage. And under GAO and Court of Federal Claims case law, there's three types of OCIs, unequal access to information, biased ground rules, and impaired objectivity. And we're going to talk about what each of those means. Now, this is a complex analysis. When a contracting officer is confronted with a potential OCI, they're expected to identify and investigate that as early as possible. And they're supposed to conduct a very fact in specific inquiry into the OCI. 
And it's important to recognize that OTAs are dynamic. They can change depending on the kind of work your company is doing, who you're employing, who you're teaming with. And mo most important of all, it's, it's good to know that many OCIs can be mitigated, neutralized, or avoided. So just because you have an OCI does not mean you're necessarily prohibited from getting that contract that you want. Okay, so the first type of OCI we're going to talk about is unequal access to information. Now that occurs when a contractor has access to competitively useful non-public information through the performance of another government contract. This does not include just being an incumbent. Uh, often people think that the incumbent has an unfair advantage, but that's not an, an OCI. Uh, the kind of information that we're talking about here is government information or information about other contractors that you're exposed to during contract performance. So some examples are while performing a support service contract, a company has access to agency network that has budget information about other contracts, including labor categories, rates, numbers of employee hours, and fundings. So it's their competitor's pricing information. That gives them an unfair advantage, and it's an unequal access to information OCI. Likewise, another example here, company A teamed with company B to provide procurement support services to an agency, that's phase one, and then company C proposed company A as a subcontractor for phase two. GA held, GAO held that this was an OCI because company A had access to contracts, core requirements, information of other companies, and non-public information relevant to the agency activity. And now we're going to talk about mitigating unequal access to information OCIs. Now this is the easiest type of OCI to mitigate. There's usually no need to have government involvement, which is why it makes it easier. You just focus on limiting access to competitively useful information. And it, you need to be proactive and forward-looking. You need to start these mitigation measures as soon as that you, even before you have access to this information to make sure that you're containing who has access to that information. So the things you can use to do that are firewalls, non-disclosure agreements, locating personnel in separate spaces or facilities, document control, employee training to teach people not to discuss this kind of information with other people, and then if for some reason you're unable to use those kind of firewall measures, the government can mitigate this kind of OCI by releasing competitively useful information to all of the competitors so that everyone's on the same page and give an equal playing field. The second type of OCI is a bias ground rules OCI, and it's really when a contractor is involved in, in preparing solicitation documents or future contract requirements. It's not limited to just the specs. It can be any document that influences the way proposals are evaluated and could give a bias ground rules OCI. This OCI is based on a concern that a contractor, whether intentionally or not, would shape the procurement in a way that favors that contractor. And this example that we have here shows that it, it doesn't have to be something that's so entrenched in like dra drafting the PWS, for instance. In this Energy Systems Group case from GAO, a company was a contractor on a contract to prepare a, a report that made recommendations on measures to use to conserve energy. The subcontractor was then excluded from competing for an energy efficiency design build contract because 80% of the contract requirements came from that study that it worked on on the incumbent contract. So again, it's one of those situations where they were involved in something that helped shape the procurement, helped shape the specifications, and the feeling is under this OCI that they could have intentionally or not shaped the procurement in their favor. So how do you mitigate a bias ground rules OCI? This is one of the most difficult OCIs to mitigate because as I said, it's not whether it was intentional or not. It can be a totally inadvertent OCI. It's a conflict that is created by the organization's affiliations and their, just the inherent economic interest a company has in, in being competitive. Firewalls are generally ineffective for mitigation of a biased ground rules OCI. The use of a separate division or entity is also sufficient. So mitigation really depends on what the government says you can and cannot do to overcome the perceived or actual conflict. So some techniques and tools would be recusal. This is the most effective. Um, you have to work with the government to help them pre-identify possible efforts in creating the, that could create the OCI. 
And then you could also use a subcontractor combined with employee firewalls and NDAs with the cooperation of the government. Candidly, you have to make sure that if you are presented with this kind of OCI, you've got to make sure the government is on board because generally they don't like these situations where the work is then sent down to the subcontractor. They entered a contract with the prime for a reason and they generally like to avoid these types of mitigation techniques where it goes to the sub instead. Okay, now the third kind of OCI is impaired objectivity. That often happens in providing evaluation services. Now that can happen in the context of acquisition support, but it can also come up in other circumstances. For instance, sometimes in IT contracts, one contractor has to test the systems that another contractor has developed. Well, if you're testing your affiliate systems or something that you created previously, that would be an impaired objectivity OCI. So the first example here we have is an offeror would be providing analytical and technical support services to assess undersea warfare systems. The agency awarded the contract to a company that manufactured 12 of the 59 systems to be tested. So there you'd have an OCI because they'd have to be reviewing, assessing, evaluating their own systems. And the second example, the contractor would be providing consolidated IT operations and maintenance services, including making recommendations about existing programs. That company A had a contract to provide the agency's desktop environment, and the agency selected company A for award. And that was an OCI because the company would need to be making recommendations about its own desktop environment services. Uh, here are the mitigation measures for impaired objectivity OCIs. They are extremely difficult to mitigate, and that's because it's based on affiliation with an organization and economic interest. Firewalls are ineffective. Use of a separate division or entity is insufficient because they still are affiliated or tied to the other party. Any knowledge or potential knowledge of the entity being evaluated is likely to trigger this OCI. So the techniques and tools you can use are using a subcontractor or neutral third party. And like Megan said, the government needs to be on board with that option. Uh, and you can also rely on objective criteria where there's no chance for the contractor to be influencing the outcome of the evaluation. And then government, and supervision, government supervision and control is necessary to obscure the identity of the evaluated entity and eliminate any identifying information. And for OCIs, it's important to know that the government can actually choose to waive an OCI. It doesn't happen all that often, but it is an option that they can take advantage of. And to do that, the FAR requires the agency head or designee to waive the, any potential OCI by determining that it would not be in the government's interest to preclude that contractor from performing. Any request for a waiver must be in writing, shall set forth the extent of the conflict and requires approval by the agency head or designee. And this cannot be delegated below the level of the head of the contracting activity. And then we have this one case here, MC Federal LLC, that shows that once the agency waives an OCI, it's very difficult to challenge that because as you see in this last bullet, uh, where procurement decisions such as whether an OCI should be waived is committed by statute or regulation to the discretion of an agency, GAO is not going to make an independent determination on that matter. And Michelle, I know you and I have dealt with this issue before, and contractors are often surprised to find out that agencies have the ability to waive an OCI. I think there's a misconception out there that once there's an actual con organizational conflict of interest, that contractor will not be allowed to perform the contract that they've been awarded, and unfortunately that is not 100% true. The procuring agency may make the decision that for whatever reason that they are willing to waive that organizational conflict of interest, no matter which type of OCA, OCI it is, in order to have that contractor perform. Okay, and OCIs, as we said, can influence your business considerations. And one, some of those are when you're preparing your pro proposal. So when you get a proposal or solicitation, it's important to look at whether you're being directed to submit a, submit a mitigation plan, and whether there are any restrictions on future activity. If you think you might have an OCI for this procurement, you, can, you should get out in front by talking to the contracting officer or other procurement personnel 
and try to avoid, neutralize, or mitigate that OCI pre-award. If you try to understate or hide the OCI, it imposes risks. Like the agency may come to its own analysis and find you are being deceptive, or if they award you the contract, you may end up in a protest, and if you haven't mitigated it, that's going to hurt your chances of winning the protest. So you want to work with the government pre-proposal to address all of these major questions. And then address the issues. Submit a mitigation plan. Work with the agency to develop a robust mitigation plan. Um, the agency can communicate with you before award about your mitigation plan, and it's not considered discussions. So you can have a good dialogue with the agency. And when possible, you should address the OCI directly in your proposal and be confident about how you're mitigating it. And Michelle, we, you know, what's, let's kind of brainstorm for a second about what are some factors that contractors should think about, you know, because they're hearing this, they're hearing what OCIs are, but maybe they don't realize that this is something that they need to worry about. And the first thing that pops into my mind is if you are a company providing acquisition support services to the government, you need to be on top of potential OCIs. I think that's the number one area that we see them arise. I think that's right. And if you're in a circumstance where you're evaluating other companies in, in any context, that's also right for OCIs. So those are two, when you're really in there entrenched in helping an agency with its procurement processes, the, that's certainly an area that's going to be just right for an OCI issue. And if you're not already ahead of it, then you need to get ahead of it now. Now let's say you think somebody else has an OCI, then maybe you're going to want to submit a pre-award or post-award protest. The timing depends on what you know and the position the agency is taking. If you believe that another offeror or its team member has an OCI and that concern has been raised to the agency and the agency is allowing the offeror to compete, you need to protest before proposals are due. The GAO and the court views that kind of protest as a term of the solicitation, and that's why it needs to be submitted before award. If the agency excludes you because of a potential or actual OCI before proposals are due, you need to protest that before your proposal is due. And if, you, if there's a harmful blanket prohibition on, on your participation, you would need to protest that also before proposals are due. Now, you would protest after award if you found out that an offeror had an OCI, the awardee had an OCI, and you did not know about that before award. That would be timely after award. Now, in that protest, the standard of review is going to be the responsibility of identifying the OCI and whether the exclusion is warranted. It's going to rest with the contracting officer. So the GAO looks at what the contracting officer did. They are given considerable discretion. And as the protester, you need to identify hard facts that indicate the existence or potential existence of an OCI. And once you've shown that OCI exists, you don't need to show that the awardee had that unfair advantage. It's just the fact that they could have with those hard facts is enough. And now, um, back in 2011, the, there was a big rule change proposed for OCIs. This would recategorize OCIs and put them in FAR Part 3. It would distinguish between OCIs that create an unfair competitive advantage and OCIs that impact the government's interests. And as Megan said about the waiver, this would change the way that waivers could be done. The government would be able to waive the second kind of OCI, which affects the government's interest, but it would not be able to waive the kind of OCI that creates an unfair competitive advantage. And COs under this new rule would have great discretion to address and accept the risk posed by that second type. The new rule would also have new solicitation and contract provisions, and it would create a new FAR subpart 4.4 for safeguarding information within industry. And I was at an event earlier this month where some people who were involved in the rulemaking suspected that this rule might come out this month. So we are watching for that to happen. So stay tuned to the Polaro Mazza website for new information about the new OCI rule. But for now, that I think covers it on OCIs. We'll come back to some, I'm sure, in the question and answer period. But we're going to move on to a, a slightly related topic of restrictions on post-government employment. 
And again, we're just going to do kind of a broad overview of the restrictions so that if and when you are talking to either a current or former government employee and you are thinking of hiring that person, you're informed on what restrictions apply. We're going to discuss the Procurement Integrity Act because obviously that has some overlap with protests and OCIs. We're going to discuss the lifetime restriction, which we'll explain, but just think particular matter plus participated personally and substantially. We're going to discuss the two-year restriction, no matter what level of employee it is. Again, that's particular matter plus official responsibility. A one-year restriction, and that's any matter plus a former senior employee. The two-year restriction, again, which is any matter plus a former senior, very senior employee. And then at the end, we're going to touch on the prohibition against any type of compensation for representational services. So first, the Procurement Integrity Act. This is something that people kind of hear. They know that it exists, but they don't really know what it means when it comes to procurements and when it comes to hiring former contracting officers, for instance. A former employee and former government employee may not accept compensation from a contractor that has been awarded a competitive or sole source contract as an employee, officer, director, or consultant of the contractor within a period of one year after that former government employee served, you know, for instance, as the procuring contracting officer or other member of the source selection team when the contract award value was in excess of $10 million or if that person served as a program manager, deputy program manager, or administrative contracting officer for a contract that, again, is in excess of $10 million to that contractor, or if that employee personally made the federal agency decision to award a contract or subcontractor mod to that contractor for $10 million or more, established overhead or other rates applicable to a contract or contracts for that contractor that are valued in excess of $10 million or more, that employee approved issuance of a contract payment or payments in excess of $10 million to that contractor, or that employee made the decision to pay or settle a claim in excess of $10 million for that contractor. So again, you can see the recurring theme is that the former employee held some type of authority, procurement authority within the agency. They dealt with that contractor that they're now proposing to work with, and that contractor received a contract or some kind of contracting action in excess of $10 million. Additionally, and this is where I think the Procurement Integrity Act comes up the most, or at least what we hear, is the former employee may not disclose contractor bid or proposal information or source selection information before the award of a federal agency procurement contract to which the information relates other than as provided for by law. So you can't go and hire a former employee and expect them to spill all their secrets. They are not, hopefully will not be doing that, and if you hear that they are, then that needs to be reported. So what comes up a lot is contractors in the rumor mill hear that there might be a Procurement Integrity Act violation and they want to protest it. This is the most important thing you need to know about protesting a PIA violation. You need to give the agency a chance to investigate. And that's why the statute requires that you provide 14-day notice. So a person, you are precluded from filing a protest against the award or proposed award of a contract with the GAO, and the GAO will not consider that protest unless you have no later than 14 days after you first discovered the possible violation, reported it to the federal agency. So within 14 days of learning that there could be a potential PIA violation, you must tell the contracting agency. If it's the contracting officer who is at issue that you're hearing these, you know, potential violations about, then understandably you're not want to go, want, don't want to go to the CO and say, I heard you might be violating the Procurement Integrity Act, in which case you need to go to someone, it, it could be the contracting specialist, but it would make more sense to find someone senior to the contracting officer, report the violation, and do so within 14 days. If you do not do that, if you do not make the report within 14 days of first discovering this potential violation, you cannot protest to the GAO. GAO will not even hear the protest. 
once the agency is notified of the potential violation, they will investigate it. And FAR 3.104-7 lays out the requirements for the agency's investigation. Essentially, the contracting officer has to make an initial determination of prejudice. Again, if it's the CO who's at issue, then the CO is obviously not the one who's going to be doing the investigation. But they have to make an initial determination of prejudice, and then it goes up the ladder and is reviewed by other officials within the agency. At that point in time, what tends to happen more often than not is the protest ground starts to, ground start to center on the nature of the agency's investigation and their decision with regard to that investigation and less so on the violation itself. So now we're moving into what are the post-government employment restrictions beyond Procurement Integrity Act. So there is the lifetime restriction, we, we mentioned that, and then there are different types of two-year and one-year restrictions. The terms, for instance, on this slide that are highlighted in red, these are recurring terms. So we're going to walk through the lifetime restriction first, explain what these terms mean with regard to the lifetime restriction, knowing that these terms will come up with the other types of restrictions. All of these restrictions are in statute. They're at 18 U.S.C. Section 207. If you all want to pull that up and read that at night, I know you do. But the statute itself does not have a lot of meat on it. So the language that we're sharing with you today comes from the regulations. The regulations do provide examples. They are written in a way that are, it's supposed to be easy for a layperson to understand. And the lifetime restriction itself is in 5 CFR section 2641.201. So what is the lifetime restriction? The lifetime restriction provides that no former employee, no matter their title, no matter their rank, no former employee shall knowingly, with the intent to influence, make any communication to or appearance before an employee of the United States on behalf of any other person in connection with a particular matter involving a specific party or parties in which he, the former employee, participated personally and substantially and in which the United States is a, is a party or has a direct and substantial interest. So that first phrase, intent to influence, what does intent to influence mean? The intent to influence is a communication or appearance is made with the intent to influence, meaning made for the purpose of seeking a government ruling, benefit, approval, or other discretionary government action, or affecting government action in connection with an issue or aspect of a matter which involves an appreciable element of actual or potential dispute or controversy. In other words, you're trying to persuade someone in the government to do something for someone else. And this example kind of lays this out. A former government employee calls an agency official to complain about the auditing methods being used by the agency in connection with an audit of a government contractor for which the former employee serves as a consultant. The former employee has made a communication with the intent to influence because his call was made for the purpose of seeking government action in connection with an issue involving an appreciable element of dispute. He called to complain about the audit and it was an ongoing audit that's seen as a dispute. Now, the intent to influence is not present. These will not give rise to a potential violation when, for instance, the former employee is making a routine request not involving a potential controversy, when the employee is making factual statements or asking factual questions in a context that doesn't suggest any kind of dispute. This can be such as when the employee, or the, excuse me, the former employee is conveying factual information regarding matters that are not potentially controversial during the regular course of performing a contract. For instance, if the former government employee is, is asked by the CEO, when is this deliverable going to be received, and the person says Friday, that's not intent to influence. That's a factual matter because he knows that they are on, on board and on target to deliver on Friday. Signing and filing the tax return of another person as a preparer is not an intent to influence. Signing an insurance, an assurance that one will be responsible as the principal investigator with regards to a grant. Filing a SEC form 10-K or other disclosure form. Making a communication at the initiation of the government. 
concerning work performed or to pre be performed under a government contract or grant during a routine government site visit to premises owned or occupied by a person other than the United States where the work is performed or would be performed in the ordinary course of performance of a contract or grant. And then lastly, purely social contacts are not made with the intent to influence. That's just simply not present. Okay, now the next term is a communication or appearance. Communication means to impart or transmit information of any kind, including facts, opinions, ideas, questions, or direction to any employee of the United States, whether orally, in written correspondence, by electronic media, or by any other means. And an appearance is being physically present before an employee of the United States in either a formal or informal setting. So for a phone call, an email, a letter is not an appearance. Now here's an example. A former employee of the FBI makes a brief telephone call to a colleague in her former office concerning an ongoing investigation. She has made a communication. If she personally attends an informal meeting with agency personnel concerning the matter, she will have made an appearance. Behind the scenes assistance is okay. So you can hire an employee, a former government employee who's working behind the scenes. Nothing in this section prohibits that person from providing assistance to you or anyone else. Providing that assistance does not involve a communication to or an appearance before an employee of the United States. But Mere physical presence may be enough. Under some circumstances, a former employee's mere physical presence without any communication may constitute an appearance with the intent to influence an employee of the United States. So some relevant considerations to look at when you're trying to decide whether mere physical presence may be enough are if the formal employee has been given actual or apparent authority to make any decisions, commitments, or substantive arguments in the course of the appearance, if the government employee before whom the appearance is made has substantive responsibility for the matter and does not simply perform ministerial functions, such as the acceptance of paperwork, the former employee's presence is relatively prominent, they're standing out, the former employee is paid for making the appearance, if it is anticipated that the other persons present at the meeting will make reference to the views or past or present work of the former employee, if the circumstances do not indicate that the former employee is present merely for an informational purposes, for example, merely to listen and record information for later use, if the former employee has entered a formal appearance in connection with a legal proceeding at which he is present, and lastly, the appearance is before a former subordinate or others in the same chain of command as the former employee. So I'm sure you're asking yourself, if mere physical presence is enough, what about at conferences and public gatherings? How can we handle that? A former employee, former government employee, who addresses a public gathering or a conference, seminar, or similar form as a speaker or panel participant will not be considered to be making a prohibited communication or appearance if the forum meets the following criteria. First, it cannot be sponsored or co-sponsored by a federal agency or an independent agency in the executive, legislative, or judicial branch by a federal court or court martial. Second, the forum must be attended by a large number of people. You're going to ask me, what's a large number of people? The answer is the reg doesn't say, it just says a large number of people. Five, I would say, is not large. 500 is large. And third, there must be a significant proportion of those attending who are not employees of the United States. So for instance, if it were a NACA conference, the NACA conference was not sponsored by a federal agency, there is a large number of people in attendance, and a significant proportion of those attending are not employees of the United States, then that former government employee could very well make an appearance, uh, be a speaker or panel participant at the NACA conference and not be making any type of prohibited communication or appearance. In these circumstances, a former employee may engage in exchanges with any other speaker or with any member of the audience. The former employee also may permit the broadcast or publication of a commentary provided that it is a broadcast or appears in a newspaper, periodical, or similar widely available publication. 
So we've, we've gone through now the intent to influence language. We've gone through the communication or appearance language. Now we're at the particular matter element. So what's a particular matter that this former employee cannot communicate about to other, to current government employees? A particular matter must involve specific parties. The term itself is not defined in the statute, but it generally means a, a specific contract, grant, license, product approval application, enforcement action, administrative adjudication, or court case. A contract is almost always a single particular matter involving specific parties. Successive or otherwise separate contracts or agreements will be viewed as different matters from each other, absent some indication that one contract or other type of agreement contemplated the other or that both are in support of the same specific proceeding. So generally speaking, if there is incumbent contract A, that former government employee will be, will be prohibited from communicating with regards to incumbent contract A because they, they were in, involved in that contract. But if they were not involved in, in the successor contract B, they have no prohibition on communicating with regard to successor contract B, even if it is the su successor contract because they were, first of all, not involved, but also because it's not deemed to be the same thing. It's a separate matter under this definition. And here we are, the last element that the lifetime restriction applies to a former government employee with regards to communications or appearances, intent to an influence, with regard to a particular matter with which they were participated personally and substantially. To participate means to take an action as an employee through decision, approval, disapproval, recommendation, the rendering of advice, investigation, or other such action, or to purposely forbear in order to affect the outcome of a matter. An employee does not participate in a matter merely because he had knowledge of its existence or because it was pending under his official responsibility, and we're going to get into official responsibility in a couple slides. But to participate personally means participate directly, either individually or in combination with other persons, or through direct and active supervision of the participation of any person he supervises, including a subordinate. To participate substantially means that the employee's involvement is of significance to the matter. So that was our lifetime restriction. Now we're at a two-year restriction. And again, these terms come up a lot, which is why we spent so much time with regards to the lifetime restriction and what each of these terms mean. The two-year restriction involves a particular matter, which we just discussed, involving official responsibility. And we're going to define that in just a slide. So for two years after his government service terminates, no former employee shall knowingly, with the intent to influence, make any communication to or appearance before an employee of the United States on behalf of any other person in connection with a particular matter involving a specific party or parties in which the United States is a party or has a direct and substantial interest in which such person knows or reasonably should know was actually pending under his re official responsibility within the one year period prior to the termination of his government service. And there's the regulatory site in case you want to take a look at what's in the reg. So again, it's one year prior official responsibility. So what's official responsibility? That's direct administrative or operating authority, whether intermediate or final, and either exercisable alone or with others, and either personally or through subordinates, to approve, disapprove, or otherwise direct government action. Ordinarily, the scope of an employee's official responsibility is determined by those functions assigned by statute, regulation, executive order, job description, or delegation of authority. All particular matters under consideration in an agency are under the official responsibility of the agency head. And each is under that of an, any intermediate supervisor who supervises a person, including a subordinate, who actually participates in the matter or who has been assigned to participate in the matter within the scope of his official duties. A non-supervisory employee does not have official responsibility for his own assignments. 
So really what, what this is targeting is supervisors who oversee matters and direct action on behalf of the government. Now there are some exceptions and waivers to the lifetime restriction and two-year official responsibility. They do not apply to a former employee who is acting on behalf of the United States, acting as an elected state or local government official, communicating scientific or technical information pursuant to a procedure or certification, testifying under oath, uh, except for generally expert testimony, acting on behalf of an international organization pursuant to a waiver, or acting as an employee of government-owned, contractor-operated entity pursuant to a waiver. There's an additional one-year restriction on former senior employees concerning any matter regardless of prior involvement. So this is any senior employee on any matter. And that provides for one year after his service in a senior position terminates, no former senior employee may knowingly, with the intent to influence, which we defined earlier, make any communication or appearance before an employee of an agency in which he served in any capacity within a one-year period prior to his termination from a senior position. If that communication or appearance is made on behalf of any other person in connection with any matter on which the former senior employee seeks official action by an employee of such agency. And there's the regulatory site if you would like to look up that provision. Seeks official action is one term we have not seen before, and that means that a former senior official is, we have this when he's uh, making communications or his appearance for the purpose of inducing a current employee to make a decision or to otherwise act in his official capacity. And again, there are exceptions and waivers to this one-year restriction for former senior employees. And here they are generally you know, acting on behalf of the United States, um, making an uncompensated statement based on special knowledge, testifying under oath, except generally expert testimony does not qualify. Um, and the reason is that's seen as um, trying to persuade. Expert testimony is sometimes seen as persuasive even though I think lawyers might want to tell you it's objective, <laughs> depending on what side they're on. So Michelle just laid out the one-year restriction on former senior employees. There's a separate two-year restriction on former very senior employees concerning any matter regardless of prior involvement. So generally speaking, a senior employee is going to be someone on the SES, the Senior Executive Schedule. And broadly speaking, a very senior employee is going to be an appointee, someone who is very high up in the agency and must be appointed by the president or vice president. So for two years after his service in a very senior employee position terminates, no former very senior employee shall knowingly, with the intent to influence, make any communication to or appearance before any official appointed to an executive scheduled position or before any employee of an agency in which he served as a very senior employee within the one year period prior to his termination from a very senior employee position. If that communication or appearance is made on behalf of any other person in connection with any matter on which the former very senior employee seeks official action by any official or employee. For instance, um, and I think this was in the news yesterday, Deputy Secretary of the Army would qualify as a very senior employee. So under this, the, that former Deputy Secretary could not go, let's say he was overseeing the, you know, some kind of, you know, Army procurement, let's say dealing with helicopters. If he oversaw that helicopter procurement, he could then not go back and make communications with the intent to influence any Army personnel with regards to any matter, including maybe if he's employed by the helicopter contractor. And again, there are exceptions and waivers, generally acting on behalf of the United States or if they're acting as an elected state or local government official 
making uncompensated statements, um, testifying under oath except for expert testimony, acting as an employee of a government-owned contractor-operated entity pursuant to a waiver. And the final restriction we're going to discuss today is the prohibit prohibition against receiving compensation for representational services. And that's in 18 U.S.C. Section 203, which prohibits a former employee from receiving any compensation for representational service in connection with a particular matter in which the United States is a party or has a direct and substantial interest if the covered representational services were provided at a time when the individual was a government employee and regardless of whether or not the individual personally provided those representational services. Representational services means communications to or appearances before federal entities with the intent to influence the government on behalf of a third party. This includes legal and consulting services. What comes to mind for you is probably a lobbyist. That, that's what this is discussing. The prohibition applies equally to representational services rendered by the former employee personally or by another if the employee shares in the compensation. Accordingly, a former employee may not share in compensation received by his or her new employer for representational services it provided to a third party in connection with a particular matter in which the United States is a party or has a direct and substantial interest at the time the former employee worked for the government. And lastly, here we have some recommendations for hiring former government employees. You should gain an understanding of the employee's level of authority, know, you know who they were responsible for, what they worked on, ask for the employee's job description with the government, request a copy of the employee's ethics opinion, which they should have got when they left the government, and that explains what they can and can't do. Have the employee sign representations and certifications regarding what he's told you and his ethics opinion. It's, the ethics opinion is so important that becomes a guiding document for the former employee and for his, you know, potential new employer. So whenever we get questions, whenever our clients call and say we're thinking about hiring this former government employee, the very first question that we ask is, do you have his ethics opinion? And I will tell you, we had one instance where the former employee said, what ethics opinion? <laughs> and after we did some digging, we we discovered that the person was not actually yet former, they were still working for the government, and that raises a whole other bag of issues for contractors. So we had to slowly back away from that situation, but it's just so important because the ethics opinion really does guide you on what the employee can and cannot do. And when you get a copy of that ethics opinion, carefully draft what the employee's job description is going to be with your company. Don't, if this is, you know, going back to my example of, you know, um, someone who was relatively senior in the Army, maybe over, oversaw a helicopter procurement, don't put in his job description that you expect him to go and convince the Army to buy your helicopters because that's going to be a red flag. And very often, depending on the level of seniority of the person who's, who's leaving the government, they, the ethics counselors will ask for, if they have something lined up already for their future work, they will ask to review that job description because they want to make sure that everybody's on board with what restrictions apply. So carefully draft that job description, get a copy of the employee's ethics opinion, and then have the employee sign representations and certifications to you as their new employer that he has told you everything, he's provided you a copy of everything regarding the ethics opinion and what his limitations are. Because if you find out later that he did not do that, that he wasn't as upfront as he should have been, this is a way for you to, you know, get out of the contract and, if necessary, go after that person should you incur any kind of um, damages. But to be candid, when it comes to these restrictions, the civil and criminal penalties that exist, they fall on the former employees. And it can be fines and it can be imprisonment. So it's a very serious matter, which is why it's so important for them to have their ethics opinion. And Michelle, we did a great job on time, and we have a handful of questions. So Karen asked that with regards to the Procurement Integrity Act and the establishing overhead or other rates applicable to a contract or contracts for that contractor that are valued in excess of $10 million, does this extend to DCAA auditors? 
or is it only applicable to contracting officers? The answer is it could extend to the auditors if the auditors helped establish those overhead rates and the contract is in excess of $10 million. Let's see, we have another question. Would a former senior employee or very senior employee be able to be hired as an employee or consultant to provide a contractor strategic advice regarding the future direction of the contractor so long as that former senior employee or very senior employee does not attempt to influence any current government employees? What do you think, Michelle? I think that would be okay because you'd be providing that behind the scenes assistance that we discussed earlier. That's absolutely right. And again, you know, social contacts are okay. If, they ha if, if your consultant happens to run into some of his former colleagues at a cocktail party, that's all well and good. He does have to be careful about, he can't use that opportunity to try to get that person to send more work to the contractor, but um, that in and of itself is fine. Let's see, next question. What about lower level government employees that are proposed as key personnel while still a government employee but intend to separate prior to contract award? What happens if the contract is awarded before the employee leaves the government? Michelle, you might have some insight on, on this scenario. Uh, we, we have confronted that before. Um, it really depends on what information if we're talking about an awardee putting that in their proposal, what information the government was aware of at the time uh, when it's making the evaluation, if you can show the agency should have known that or did know it, it may be a basis for sustaining the protest if you were to file a protest. Here's an interesting one about OCIs. Do the potential conflicts of a joint venture partner flow to the joint venture? In other words, does the joint venture have an impaired objectivity OCI if it was re reviewing the work of one of its parent companies? The, the OCI would apply to that, the joint venture's contract if the information the joint venture member had was applicable to that contract and you didn't have any firewalls in place to prevent that information from reaching the employees who would be supporting that contract. And I think, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, but the analysis would be the same for any subsidiary that the OCIs of the subsidiary could flow up to its parent and vice versa, depending on the circumstances and whether it was mitigated. Correct. All right. And then I think we had, just to clarify, someone asked, Peter, I think we, we answered this question, but you phrased it a different way, but just in case. Under the Procurement Integrity Act, if the former government employee was, let's say, the director of operations, not a PM or DPM, but a very high-level employee, is that former government employee precluded from being an employee or consultant of a contractor? No, they can, as Michelle said, they can definitely work behind the scenes, and they just cannot make a communication or appearance on behalf of the contractor under certain circumstances dealing with certain matters, depending on which restriction we're looking at and what that person was responsible for. We also received one question before the webinar asking whether a prime contractor could change the OCI clauses that flowed down in a subcontract. And I mean that would really depend on what was changed. You definitely would not want to make any material changes to those provisions. The, the government is concerned with a subcontractor or a prime contractor having an OCI. So any I would not recommend making any changes to those clauses. Uh, whether it could be acceptable to the government would really depend on the facts and circumstances in that arrangement. And then someone asked, what are the restrictions on making offers to current government technical employees? So we're going to assume that these are employees who have absolutely nothing to do with procurement. They sit in their cubicle, they, pro they count their beans or whatever it is that they do. Generally speaking, there's not going to be any kind of restriction on you making an offer to that person. It, we, it only comes up when we're dealing with procurement, and even then, it's only an issue if the contract in question is in excess of $10 million. And you would want to be mindful if that person was involved in any work that you want to submit a proposal for. That could give rise to an unequal access to information OCI and potentially other OCIs, depending when they planned on moving to you and how far that developed while they were still at the agency. Yeah, that's a great point. And it just goes to show you how fact-specific each of these scenarios are. So generally speaking, a technical employee would be okay, but you still want to kind of vet to see what's the relationship you have with that person and with that person's agency. 
Can a small business reasonably create a good OCI mitigation plan given that they are small and don't have many options other than not bidding? I think I know what Michelle's going to say, but let's see. It really depends on the type of OCI. I mean, if it's um, an unequal access to information situation and it's a relatively small contract and you're able to silo off a couple people to solely focus on that contract, it wouldn't be a problem. An impaired objectivity would be harder to work with, but maybe you could work out a situation with a subcontractor and you wouldn't be reviewing the subcontractor's work. Um, similar to a biased ground rules, you may be able to use a subcontractor. I think there's always a possibility of work finding a solution. You shouldn't, you shouldn't run away just because you see an OCI. You should try to find a solution. Absolutely. I think that, that goes through the regulations, that the government does not want to use. If you're doing a great job for the government in one aspect, they don't, they don't want good contractors to go away or to be precluded from doing more good work for the government. So I think the government is open to finding ways to mitigate these issues. But that gets a lot harder the later it is for you to discover the issue. So the more ahead of it you are, the better position you're in. And sometimes you do need to kind of educate the government personnel. They can be rather skittish with OCIs. They may not understand all the measures you've done and all the considerations that need to be taken. So we often, you know, help our clients in communicating with agencies and writing a letter, cover letter of the mitigation plan, helping to develop the mitigation plan and explain why all of the issues have been fully addressed and there aren't any more problems. That's a great uh, point to, to say, you know, what we do with, with each of these matters. We do help with, first of all, identifying an OCI because sometimes o what smells like an OCI isn't actually an OCI. So that's the very first step that we take. If we do believe that there's a potential OCI, then we do help our clients draft up mitigation plans. And those are mitigation plans that either are implemented without regard to a proposal or they're mitigation plans that become part of a contractor's proposal. We also help in the event of a protest, both defending and prosecuting protests concerning these OCI issues. And on, then on the post-government employment restrictions, we have done legal opinion memoranda to advise clients on how to go about hiring former government employees and what the person can or cannot do. We've worked on offer letters. We've worked on employment agreements for these people. So we can really help contractors in a full range of what they need with both of these issues. And with that, I think, I think that's it, Michelle. I think we've covered everything. If we have not answered a question, uh, please feel free to email us. Our emails are on the screen. Our phone numbers are there as well. You will receive a copy of these slides. Once you have a chance to read through them, please let us know if you have any questions. And thank you all for attending this afternoon. Have a great day.